Okay, everyone. Uh, hopefully, you can uh, you can all hear uh, hear myself and and see uh, Dr. Joe Verrill as well. Uh, welcome hi, to hi. Hi. Um, welcome to uh, the Connecting Childcare webinar today. My name is Chris Reed. I'm the the founder and CEO of uh, Connect Childcare. Um, we're the, one of the leading suppliers of management software in the UK. Uh, and we've pulled together uh, this series of, of multi-channel events, really, for connecting childcare, um, just to uh, sort of bring uh, more information, educational content across a number of different channels. They'll they'll range from webinars, uh, virtual events, newsletters, and focusing on obviously uh, some topical areas for the early year sector uh, right now, particularly around uh, the issues with COVID-19. Uh, but also into areas such as child development, uh, childcare management and parental engagement as well. Um, I'm delighted to introduce you all to Dr. Joe Verrill, uh, the Managing Director of CEDA Research. Um, jo uh, will introduce herself in a moment. Uh, she's responsible for the About Early Years campaign, uh, which is uh, a project that Connect Childcare have been involved in for a number of years now uh, and is, uh, is providing a much needed heartbeat uh, for uh, the uh, information and, and things that are going on in the sector. So, without further ado, I will uh, I will pass you over to Joe to introduce herself. Hi, thanks, Joe. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, I'm M I'm MD at CEDA. Um, we've been working with the early years sector for about 20 years now, um, basically carrying out research into sector trends. Uh, sector support needs, finance and sustainability, capacity, operating costs, all a whole um, a whole bag of stuff really. And um, we launched the About Early Years project uh, in 2017 and that was really about trying to get a handle on all of those issues on a regular basis in a systematic way. So although we've been looking at things like operating costs, funding gaps, workforce challenges through ad hoc projects, that was kind of as and when um, people were able to commission the work and as with everything in early years those budgets are always very strapped so we launched the um, about early years project really to invite people to come together around a, a research program that could actually be systematic and continue year on year and essentially that piece of work comprises of two really detailed studies every year a workforce survey and a, a finance survey, coupled with lots of number crunching on official stats that are available through lots of different sources right across the year. Um, we pull those together in regular reports, culminating in an annual report. Um, the work does get used extensively now um, across all sorts of different forums. It's been drawn on by the House of Commons Treasury Committee, National Audit Office, Social Mobility Commission, it's it's regularly referenced in Westminster debates where um, you know policy, government policy is being um, you know held accountable and and uh, and um, challenged if you like in terms of the, that evidence base. So that's kind of broadly where we were coming from with the about early years project. Did you want me to go straight into the portal information now, Chris? Or um, yeah, I think it. Um, I think it might be just interesting. Thanks for the thanks for the background on that. Um, I think just in terms of the format for today, it's going to be a, a series of of questions uh, for Jo around particular areas. Some of those will lead into the data portal that she's just referenced. Um, some of the uh, there will also be the opportunity for the attendees to um, raise questions. Uh, there is a bit of a glitch in the uh, in the webinar software at the moment, so they will be sent to me via traditional chat so uh, feel free to send those across the one thing that is worth point um, bearing in mind though is um, if there are any particular um, questions uh, around early areas of um, you know particular uh, concern at the moment with regards to uh, challenges around furlough or grant allocation from local authorities given the, the recent announcements uh, we would recommend that they're channeled through to your membership organizations so the likes of ey alliance AC, NDNA, uh, and, and such as. So um, just wanted to, to frame that first. Um, and then um, I thought we'd start just by jumping into the questions, Joe. Um, and given, you know, we've obviously been involved in the, the About Early Years project with yourself for, for a number of years now. So I've seen the, you know, firsthand the, 
the benefit that that's brought to the sector. Um, just from that research, what would you suggest that the, uh, the biggest challenges facing the early years industry currently uh, are as a whole? Yeah, I think certainly, I mean, before we got into the current pandemic situation, the, the sector clearly had several really key challenges that it was, um, you know, struggling to deal with, not least of which was funding positions. So we've done a great deal of work around operating costs and how they stack up with funding rates, um, the latest of which was produced just as a, um, a briefing paper prior to the election in December. Um, that's just a few short months ago, but it seems yeah. like um, it seems ago now, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that whole of the whole of the universe. At uh, that time, we were projecting for 2020-21 an 824 million um, gap between uh, funding rates and and sector costs. So, you know, huge, huge challenges. Um, and impacting providers in, in various different ways in various different parts of the country in different communities. Um, so, and that has been just, you know, we're, we're all aware that's been a historical trend and it's been getting progressively worse as the funding rates have been frozen over recent years. And the, um, the funding review outcome of last year was nominal. Um, really in terms of the funding gap and and barely touched inflation on what was already a huge huge problem so finance was was clearly um, going to be an issue and i think a lot of fear really around what would happen at april when the statutory wage rises came in and of course we're in a whole different ball game now as far as as far as that goes so the finance side of things was was looking bleak um, on top of that, there were um, huge workforce challenges, really. And again, the two are so closely interrelated because uh, funding relates to pay, which relates to who you can attract into the business and how competitive you are with everyone else out there looking for employees. And we have had an increasingly, up till now, tightening labour market where there was a lot more competition for staff. Um, we were finding that that was starting to impact on capacity within provision. So people had more children on waiting lists because literally they had vacancies that they couldn't fill. Um, and these are really, really important things to keep a sight on as we go through the current crisis because recovery is going to be in incredibly challenging. But we must remember that we started from a point that wasn't brilliant. And, I, you know, I think it's important that as we go through this crisis, that the government has that at, it, at the forefront as well, in terms of the strategic planning that will enable the sector to respond um, when lockdown lifts. So, you know, certainly a very challenging landscape ahead of, ahead of the pandemic. Yeah, so prior to, but also post uh, pandemic. Uh, and I guess that's that sort of ties into, um, you know, so the next question, which is specifically related to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. What, what kind of impact do you think that's had on the early years sector so far and, and you know, perhaps into the future as well? Hmm. I think, um, I mean, obviously, that the, the impact huge and, and, it, and it's occurring in several different ways. At the present time, um, evidence around impact is very much anecdotal and we're on calls constantly, um, as I'm sure many people are, um, you know, tapping into what's happening and what providers are reporting and what your experience is on the ground. And on that basis, and, that, and I would stress it's on that basis rather than through quantifiable work at the, at the moment, um, but I would probably draw out four different areas really of impact. Um, finance, obviously, um, private fee income dropped through the floor. Um, the support that's been put in place in terms of the continuation of um, the funding entitlements was good news, but equally not as seemingly straightforward as it was on the surface, because when you get beneath it, um, we're hearing and finding that there are different practices in different areas uh, where local authorities are introducing different rules and means of distributing funds and again the guidance also keeps shifting on that as well with um, further rigor room introduced on that in in this week's updates to the guidance so um that clearly is a huge financial impact that the 
the factors that are offsetting the final in, in financial impact, the different forms of support, I think um, it's variable for, for individual organisations as to how that pans out. Um, clearly, the withdrawal of the um, furlough funding for um, funded the funded side of the business is incredibly difficult to implement. Um, in you know, involved a huge U-turn in terms of the plans and the strategies that many people would already have been putting in place to, to manage their way through the crisis. So um, huge, huge impacts there. Um, also, um, from a childminder point of view, the clarity around whether um, childminder is going to be able to draw down um, support for self-employed um, people, sole traders, has is, is not as clear as it could be. Um, and childminders who've recently started a childminding business uh, may struggle on that front as well. So the picture is very variable. Um, I think also, um, second, second area I would flag is operationally, it's incredibly difficult at the moment. Um, providers that are um, staying open and operating, you know, how, how do you manage that fluctuating um, attendance day to day we're seeing through the portal already and we can come on to the portal in a second but we're seeing already that the numbers fluctuate each day quite quite you know that's quite typical um with some days having um no children in attendance and other days um, having children and also that the, the furlough arrangements are not helping early years provision in the sense that if you furlough staff they're not there for you to draw upon and uh, you kind of have to juggle that um decision as to how many people you follow and how many people you're going to need directly but what ifs and what ifs what if people are sick yeah. what if um you know demand suddenly changes the furlough scheme doesn't really handle that very well um so there's all sorts of um challenges and impacts on the operational side um to think about and to cope with and that is far from far from straightforward there's also obviously big impacts from a staff point of view, um, uh, personal health and well-being, not only of staff actually working in provision still and childminders um, actively operating, but also in terms of people who are furloughed. How do you ensure the health and well-being of those individuals and making sure they stay connected with the business, with their team, with their colleagues, um, so that physical isolation doesn't also turn into social isolation and all the downsides that that brings um ppe is an issue um it's been raised many times as to um you know the the, the need for that within early years provision and um staff sense of safety and, and, and personal um personal health and how that's going to be impacting potentially um on their families when they're returning home and not also with childminder um families the risk the risk there as well so lots of issues really around um, the staffing side of things. And I think also it's not just kind of the isolation within um, that you're not seeing your colleagues anymore, you're also not seeing your children anymore that you've built those attachments yeah. and relationships with, um, which kind of leads into the fourth area really, which is the impact on, on parents and children themselves and how how um you know colleagues can continue to keep that relationship going with families and communicate and engage um albeit that perhaps families are not coming into provision um and i think also around that it's you know it's it, there are there are lots of safeguarding issues as well in terms of um staff clearly with a safeguarding issue you, you know the furlough you could argue becomes a mute point because if a safeguarding issue is cropped up um, which a particular person has a lead on, you know, where do you stand with that? It's just so many different ramifications of what is happening at the minute. Um, um, and I could ramble on forever on this, so I should yeah, probably yeah. stop there. So and, and I think, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the issues that are obviously very specific, there's, there's a number of issues that are specific to the early year sector, but I think a number of the challenges that you've, you've referenced there are, are true of, of businesses of any kind. Uh, in yes. this current climate, you know, staff well-being, staff mental health, you know, having to make uh, really crucial decisions as a as a business and a business owner on very limited and changing information, I think is a, is a real challenge for everyone. And, and there are going to be areas that particularly affect uh, one industry over another. But and I guess that's that's leads in nicely to 
the next next question really in the next slide which is you know what's the explain in one sentence if you can you don't necessarily have to explain it in one sentence <laughs> i'm not very good at that evidently <laughs> <laughs> either but so um I'll give, it, I'll give it my best shot go so on so the, 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 <laughs> the portal is a it's a super simple way of capturing headline impact information there. How about that? That was really good. That was really, really good. <laughs> really penny renting, does it? So uh, essentially, the, the, the portal basically captures whether you're open or closed, and if you're open, how many children you have tending. End of. That is the, the main data that is captured. But hanging okay. underneath that, sorry, that I'm already into about three sentences. Can I go on right. or not? Keep going, Joe. Keep going. <laughs> so hanging underneath that is um bite-sized tiny little um i wouldn't call them surveys because they you know they wouldn't they wouldn't qualify as that just one or two questions at pertinent times hanging off the back of what you put into the portal um such as you know if, if you're actually um closed the you know tell us about the many different factors that led to the closure whether it's demand whether it's the fact that you were already you know um didn't have any reserves to continue and progress and come out the other side whatever it was just the different reasons for that it, it could be that we you know ask about the number of staff that are um furloughed the number of staff you've got working but all of these things would just be little sound bites um that will um, contact you to capture um, over a period of time in, in small amounts. So essentially what the portal does is it enables that tracking information, that basic headcount and operating status to be captured on a continuous basis at very little burden to yourselves. Obviously you've stretched in so many different directions right now. It literally takes one minute to hop on, put in the basic information and log out again. Um, so the burden is 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 limited. It's it's really a, a you know short amount of input time, and then as and when you know it, it's relevant to contact you, we would contact you about the things. But that would, as I say, be through short surveys. So it basically means that we're able to build up a picture of impact without hitting you with huge depth surveys, which is actually what Cedar is well known <laughs> well known for, because the About Early Years project is. It's very detailed data collection and um, that's why we're able to pull out the insight and the intelligence that we do and to make the case as we do um, you know in terms of policy direction but the portal is about simplicity and it's about just getting some timely data at the core and then off that collecting other things that are going to help um, inform both what happens during the crisis but also into recovery as well absolutely absolutely and the um just just for anybody um that's that's attending now the the website for that is www.covidportal.cedar.co.uk um and then obviously that the, the intention there is that it's more of a uh bite size uh information uh in order to give as close to real-time insights as to what's going on in this 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 difficult period um exactly yeah and if so, you know if you wanted to register sorry chris go on <laughs> Oh no, that's fine. I've just jumped on to the next slide, but <laughs> keep going. I think it's all it's all it's all intermingled into the same thing anyway. So yeah. Yeah. So I mean I guess you know I covered quite a bit of the what does the launch of the portal mean in, in my ramble um in, in response <laughs> to the first question. <laughs> Happily. Um so so yeah, I mean essentially what it means is that we're able to track what's happening in very basic terms, but also explain um, you know what's going on beneath that why things are happening what's the what is the support need and not just now but going forward and it and it's all collected through an independent um, organization CEDA so you know it has a huge amount of credibility in many different circles and particularly at Westminster so the more that people engage with that the more powerful that evidence base becomes um, and you know, I think I think that's the sort of the key things that I, that I would draw out. If if engagement isn't there, the the power of the research is diminished. So I really would encourage, even if you only want to hop on and give the bare minimum in terms of the tracking information, that is incredibly insightful and helpful in itself. Um, you're under no obligation, obviously, to you know complete the further bite-sized surveys beyond that if you don't wish to. Um, but any engagement that you have with the portal is a, is a huge, huge help. 
Yeah, and I, and I think the thanks, Joe. And I think that the the underlying thing there is that whatever data can be shared um, is obviously being utilised to be able to, you know, help in this difficult time. But also as we start to emerge from the other side of it as well, um, you know. So, so um, you know, I think I think it's a, a fantastic uh, fantastic project and one that hopefully will have a significant benefit to to the sector as a whole. Um, taking taking it a, sort of a, a layer layer down if you will so once once the portal's obviously up and running everybody's utilizing that how do you think it'll help uh, inform the government and politi um, the politicians when you know how is it going to inform policy i guess yeah i think essentially it's about timeliness and and it's and you know we keep coming back to the point that actually uh, getting through the lockdown period and and um you know, managing the the however long that period lasts and coming out the other side is one part of the picture. The bigger picture is about where the sector started off from and where it's going to head to after you know after June or whenever that that lockdown ends and and whenever um, you know the assistance starts to fall away. Um, so it's important that whatever insight and whatever intelligence is collected now it's not just about a, a snapshot picture of, of what's happening at any one point in time it's about putting it in the whole context of of the you know of what's been happening to the sector over 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 several years and to to look at what that means going forward um, and i think you know putting that together in a coherent um in a coherent way and making sense of, of all the different factors is is key in terms of influencing policy and you know CEDA gets invited to, to to many forums and channels and, and to share the work that we do um and you know putting putting in that insight on a timely basis i think is is the thing which the portal is going to be absolutely vital vital in I mean, to give you an example if you were to conduct a snapshot survey let's say in three months time perhaps about closures and so on um, a lot of what you'd be missing at that point is though those settings that have closed they're gone they're, yeah. they you know you can no longer you can no longer get that opinion it's vanished so that's why it's key that it's tracked and we ask you the relevant questions at the relevant time and we feed that through to decision makers at the relevant time which is where we're sort of coming from with with the portal Absolutely, and I think it's really key that any any decisions that are made uh, are based on on sound data. Ultimately, um, you know, things things are changing so quickly at the moment that you know it's imperative that there is that um, that that insight coming through. So, thanks for that, Joe. Um, there, were, there were two there's two strands of the work that you're doing currently. One obviously is yeah. uh, the about early years, and then the, the the data portal to to help support you know the current challenges. The other side is yeah. the early workforce panel. Can you just explain a little bit more about what that is and, and why is it important to early year staff? Yeah, so I mean, we touched on earlier about the impact of the um, crisis on on staff, as you know, as well as kind of business terms. It's also around how people are feeling right now, how engaged they feel, how socially isolated they are, how their health and well-being, you know, is 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 going along, and what kind of support they need as individuals as well as the all of the kind of business support scenario so the workforce panel is all about that and it, it essentially will involve um anyone working in early years who's signing up to the panel um, and we're going to survey them um, at monthly intervals so it's not too much of a burden um but that equally it's it's reasonably regular so and that would carry on through you know not just during the pandemic but also through into recovery so we can see for instance if, if staff have perhaps even been uh, in a position where they've been laid off and they're not actually salaried and then they're going to other posts for instance in supermarkets for example or social care because that's where the employment opportunities are right now uh, will we be able to get them back into the sector what's their you know what's where what's their thinking in terms of their future career plans all sorts of things like that will help feed into um, you know what needs to be done in terms of tackling the workforce challenges again when we come out the other side of this and, and we need to st staff settings 
um, you know, in, in the way that they have been in the past. So it's it's kind of trying to gather that insight now so we can start putting strategies in ahead of the build back up to um, full operation. It links quite closely, and well, very closely into the work of the early years um, Workforce Commission, which recently launched, which um, CEDRA is a, a member of. And, you know, the whole other side of it is how people can be, um, you know, how you can use this time productively for staff in terms of training and, um, and, and mentoring and support without impacting on the whole furlough situation. I think there's a lot of confusion around that at the moment as to whether, you know, someone engages in training, does that mean that they're actually not on furlough anymore, do you need to take them off furlough and then lose that furlough status for three weeks? And there's a whole load of um, confusion out there and understandably because the guidance is very, <laughs> It's not, it's not exactly clear. Um, so it's, it's all those issues. And, and, and just in, in a sense, it's, it's good for um, staff to feel that they have a channel to, you know, express what they're experiencing and, and share their view on the picture as well. Very much. And I guess this, this also builds on the, uh, the work that you've done prior to the, the current situation with the, um, you know, the, through the About Early Years campaign as well. Uh, and all the, the work that you've done yeah. there on the workforce. Um, yes, so. yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that we were um, pulling together research around before all of this situation hit was around how the sector could, um, what was the best way really of, of looking at promoting the sector to um, potential recruits coming in and both in terms of younger people, but also in terms of, um, you know, people already in the workforce and attracting them into early years, all sorts of things around, you know, what are, what is it that people really enjoy and love about their work? Um, the last workforce survey that we, we did um, in, in last year's round, there was um, a wealth of wonderful feedback around what people um, you know, really love about their work. It was quite tear-jerking, to be honest, reading yeah. through it. Um, it's kind of, how do you capture that magic and convey it to people in order to attract them to the sector? I mean, that's obviously something which is not on um, the burning list of issues right now because right now we're focused on getting through this dreadful period but once through and once things are starting to build um, we'll be back in with all the same problems with all the same challenges in fact yeah. just amplified so looking ahead yeah, to that is important absolutely and i guess you know the, the work that's being done now throughout this period gives you that trend to understand better what it's going to look like when we do come out the other side and be able to as you say yeah. pull the, the various strategies together to support that's that that's right um, and then you know i guess i guess final question from you know from my point of view is you know what do you think the and this, this is a very wide question um obviously you know what's your view on you know the future of the early year sector post covid and post the pandemic <laughs> Get out the crystal ball. No, um, no. Yeah. I think we'd all be doing well if we had the answer to this one. <laughs> it's hugely challenging, isn't it? Trying to anticipate really what this is going to look like. I mean, I think um, I think that the, the first sort of obvious point to make is that the um, you know as we come out of lockdown, it's likely that that is going to be a phased process, um, and that you know that has all of its implications operationally in terms of um, gearing back up but for who and for how many and for what does it mean for the number of staff that you need and the furlough bringing people furlough bringing people back in um, there, you know there are all those all those issues around trying to manage that process but there's also you know in terms of how soon occupancy will recover I think that's going to be really variable in different parts of the country because different parts, different parts of the economy are going to be hit harder than others. And yeah. so local employment patterns um, are going to pan out quite differently, I think, depending on what kind of industries and employment sectors you have locally. So it could be in some parts of the country, recovery will be a lot quicker. Um, in other communities, it will be slower. And, you know, the, the, the sector is going to have to try and... Um, get a sense of how that's going to work um, you know in your area and that is very very difficult to predict you know I think some of the things that people uh, are already flagging is that you know the 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 restrictions are going to mean that you're not actually um, getting children in and um, doing show rounds and getting people registered for September so 
<clears throat> you know, it's not going to be a case of doors open, people flood in. Um, it's yeah. going to be a lot more complicated than that. Um, there's also the concern, obviously, that the um, financial support as things stand at the moment kind of drops off the edge of a cliff in June. So what's going to happen after that? Um, people are going to have, you know, many of the things that are perhaps keeping people afloat at the moment in terms of wriggle room with rents, um, mortgage holidays and all of those things um, and the business, you know, the various different um, business support um, provision that's out there. It, you know, much of it is not going to progress as things stand into the back end of the year and that could potentially be when the sector feels the greatest pain. Yeah. Um, not to get down much of the gloomy side of things, um, but you, you know, I think that's 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 the reality. Um, on the other side of that, and, and let's try and be a little bit more optimistic to kind of close out, but on the other side of that, it's absolutely indisputable and never more so obvious than now that early years is a, an absolute core part of the infrastructure. It is the thing that enables people to go to work. Um, yeah. So therefore, the government is going to have to look very seriously at how it sustains that going forward. And if that means a second wave of support that is targeted, you know, to particular um, businesses, i.e. those that are key to infrastructure, i.e. early years, then you would hope that that, that might come, come forth. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's key that... And it's not just about the economic infrastructure, it's about the social infrastructure as well, because whilst there may be areas that bounce back in employment terms, there'll be those that don't, and those children still need to have the opportunity to have an early education. <clears throat> so how, how things fall out in terms of settings that make it through this period and settings that don't, um, you know, there needs to be an overview of that and what it means for supply within local communities and, and how that can be addressed. Um, nothing very cheery in there, other than <laughs> the fact that, you know, people will always need childcare provision. So, <laughs> and the government will always have to, you know, ensure that there is uh, that infrastructure in place. So it's kind of, you know, uh, something that is, is going to have to have some some support who knows what form that might be and and where each individual setting and child minder is you know is gonna is gonna is gonna end up at the end of this absolutely but I, mean, I think you know and i think the fact that the fact that the child care is so critical um you know in the current situation but obviously um you know generally and when things get back to normal you know maybe this will give the uh, you know the the fact that you know the the staff are seen and the the services that are provided are seen as being so um, so important from a society point of view. Maybe that will give a, a different view on some of the challenges that you've highlighted earlier um, in order to be able to perhaps yeah. come out stronger than than we went into it. Um, because as, yeah. you, as you mentioned, yeah. the, there were there were some some challenges and a and a squeeze earlier uh, prior to this. So. Um, mm -hmm. In the fact that the sector is is in demand and will will continue to be in demand when we come out the other side um, is a is a very positive thing. Um, so, yeah. so that really is the end of it. Um, and I, I've opened it out to to questions. I'm not sure if any questions have actually come through quite yet. But if uh, if anybody does have any questions for Dr. Joe or myself, then uh, <laughs> feel free feel free to ask those. Um, I'll give it maybe a minute or so. We're pretty much on time. We're just over on ever so slightly, Joe. But um, we're uh, thank you so much for for your time today and the the insights that you've managed to give. Um, you know the the Pleasure. about early work and uh, and you know and the, and the work that's been done at Cedar for for many many years now. Um, you know is a uh, is a an really important source of uh, you know statistical evidence about what's actually going on. Um, you know, and, I'm, and I absolutely firmly believe that the only way you can, you know, really make an informed choice is by having the relevant data that sits behind it. So, so great work. Uh, we've no questions so far. So I will just uh, reiterate and remind everybody um, that in order to sign up to uh, the About Early Years data portal, uh, in particular the COVID portal, it's www.covidportal.cedar.co.uk. Thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time out. Hope you managing to make uh, as much sense out of the current situation as you possibly can. And please stay safe. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.